Hello, and welcome to another episode of Balanced Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to reintroduce to you today. Sally K. Norton is a returning guest on our show. Be sure to check out her first appearance on episode 208 of Balanced Body Radio, which is one of our favorite episodes and the episode that we share around the most. Sally is an expert in the art and science of healthy eating and healthy living. Throughout her long career as a health and nutrition educator, Sally has entertained and educated diverse audiences, including medical professionals, dietitians, and social workers, among many others. Sally's background includes health research design and administration at two university medical schools and health professions education at the Program on Integrated Medicine at the University of North Carolina. Her interest and expertise in dietary oxalates originated from personal experience in healing pain and fatigue for herself and many clients. She received her degree in nutrition from Cornell University and her master's degree in public health from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. You can find her on Instagram at sknorton or on her website at www.sallyknorton.com. Sally Norton, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you back to Balanced Body Radio. It's so fun to be with you again. I know we had a good time last time, so let's see what happens today. <laughs> we had a great time last time. I absolutely meant it when I said in the intro, this is the episode that we share around the most. There's other people that maybe have a few more downloads, but this topic is so bonkers and so crazy. It's the one that we share with the most people. It's, it's a message that absolutely needs to get out and reach more people. And it turns out, it sounds like, um, it's, it's causing you to lose a little bit of sleep as you're finishing up your book. <laughs> yeah, it is a gigantic topic to get your head around. And, and those of us who've been trying to be healthy so long, we're so desperate for this information and then realize we're surrounded by other people who could so benefit from it. So there is a huge kind of sharing energy happening here. So it's really nice to hear that you guys are sharing it around. I'm just so grateful that people want to pass things forward and help each other out. It's just a beautiful thing. I'm yeah, delightful. It, it totally is. And I think if you're in this world and you're following, you know, unconventional advice, it really motivates you to really share that story. We just interviewed Jane Buxton. Uh, she just wrote the, the Great Plant-Based Con, which is a wonderful book. You're in the book, which is awesome. And I told her, like, as I was listening to the audiobook, I wanted to stop people that I was like walking by around the lake where we live and just be like, do you know that plant-based diets are a total scam? Like, <laughs> but it's so triggering. For people, I, I didn't, I didn't dare do that, but, but the <laughs> desire is there to like really get this message out and tell people. <laughs> yeah, like we're in for a big cultural revolution. We just have to open our minds and hearts that oh, we might. It's really difficult for people to drop core beliefs. It's not something we do easily. They get set into our hearts and minds before we're even verbal persons. We're learning these lessons early, and anything that our kindergarten teacher told us and our mom told us are pretty sacred at some level. And then as an adult, we start putting this intellectual spin on it and start trusting all these advisors and institutions and online influencers and celebrities and sports figures and musicians. And they're all into the plant-based thing. So they gotta be yeah. right because they outnumber us. <laughs> yeah, they, it, it's, a, it's a total mountain of, you know, this message is out there that you really need to overcome. And it's, it's only through like grassroots movement like this that, you know, we can really get the message out. And so we're so grateful for you and for everything that you've done in the book. We're so, so looking forward to reading that. Um, I do have to ask you, so here with the podcast and our little business, we are not making as much money as I thought we should. I thought we'd be Rogan at this point. We're just really not. And so we're in Salt Lake city. We're really like the capital of multi-level marketing and like really weird supplements. And like, so I'm thinking that might be the next, thing we get into let's find some bullshit supplement you know from some plant let's sell it around the world get a bunch of people in my downline and i'm wondering i'm thinking like we need some really good marketing i'm wondering do you have the contact information for the people that market kale and spinach and <laughs> almonds as superfood i would love to contact those people i i think they actually have hit men out on me right now so i'm thinking maybe like a bulletproof vest or something <laughs> you're not the person to ask <laughs> Not at all. But, you know, this is a, such an important point that we will quickly pivot to what's profitable. And in our personal lives, we pivot to what's cheap. And then we I just cut ourselves off from thinking. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's so interesting. That's a really good point. I had somebody messaging me about maybe wanting to start uh, the carnivore diet. It was asking me like how expensive it is to be a carnivore. And it's like, it costs a few bucks. It's really simple. There's a few things you need to keep in mind, but uh, th- yeah, you, you think you need to go buy a bunch of things and buy a bunch of programs and meal plans and all this stuff. And when you get to the truth, it just turns out to be a lot more simple and a lot less complex than I think people imagine. Absolutely. <laughs> and unfortunately, the nutrition space, as they say, online, you can be sort of tricked, not into just believing the wrong things, but into buying really fancy programs and really fancy, expensive products and extra coaching and, and more and more and more. And so you, you, it's bad enough to have to go to 15 doctors and six chiropractors and 30 massage therapists and on and on and on and go broke, just trying to figure out what's wrong with you. But then you start buying into these diet programs and then decide you need to be part of a coaching group and this and that. And, and then you worry about how much it costs to eat the right food. (laughs) Right. I know you're broke, but this is not the time to suddenly get cheap. Yeah, no, that's right. I, I remember when I first got into nutrition coaching was nutrition coaching the way they told me to. It was giving people meal plans with meals and snacks and all kinds of things they had to go buy and, you know, prepare and lots of food thrown away at the end of the week. And I remember one of my clients calling me at like 8 p.m. crying in the grocery store because she couldn't find arrowroot powder. Like, give me a break. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's was our mindset at the time. And luckily, you know, this information comes out and we're able to adjust and again, find things more simple for people. Um, Before we deep dive into our content today, which I know is going to be super fascinating. Let's remind our listeners a little bit about your story and how you came across this minefield of of oxalates and and plant toxins and all kinds of, of things that people just would not assume to be the case. Yeah, so I've been a lifelong nutrition geek. I remember coming home from kindergarten and telling my mother how many glasses of milk we're supposed to have because that's what they taught us today. I was interested in doing the right thing. Uh, And I, you know, I was a goody two shoes. I was how I, you know, didn't get yelled at. (laughs) And I had also had a history by the time I was in kindergarten, I had already lost my tonsils. And so I had already had a history of being fed this like nasty liquid penicillin because I had a series of strep infections and my younger sister and I both apparently had a a series of little bugs all the time and then ear infections and so on. And so they took our tonsils out. Um, And so I think by kindergarten, I was interested in being healthy, but I was also always a food geek. I always loved food. I'm the tallest in the, you know, the really most robust of my siblings because I was not a picky eater. I like the healthy stuff. So just by constitution and unfortunate early experiences, I had been interested in eating well forever. And we had food out behind the garage, which included rhubarb growing and the Kentucky Wonder Pole beans and sour apples and and sour and sweet cherries in the trees. And so I was really into that. Uh, My grandparents all loved to cook from scratch and loved fresh fruit and My mom knew how to cook from scratch. So, you know, I was a foodie forever. And by seventh grade, I learned that, you know, the way you eat influences disease. Like, oh, well, of course, what you put in your body, what you build your body with will affect whether you get cancer, heart disease or whatever. And your general health is going to affect how productive you are, how successful you are, how happy you are how much time you waste not being allowed to go in a swimming pool because you have yet another ear infection. It's so that's a motivator. Just, to me. Like in seventh grade, I'm like, I'm going to study nutrition so I can help people choose health if they want it. And so I I've basically been in health promotion forever. And then my health isn't good. I mean, it wasn't good as a little kid. It started getting going off the rails again in puberty. And it was pretty terrible through my twenties. And I've been through a lot of health stuff. Like lot. And it wasn't until I got so bad that I had to quit my job, have a hysterectomy, have a sleep study, find out that I wasn't sleeping, which is why I couldn't work anymore and wasn't recovering well from surgery and other aches and pains that led me to learn that oxalates may have something to do with certain kinds of pain from the Volvar Pain Foundation, which I learned about in 2009. And it wasn't until almost four years later or more that I had this real insight because that organization were, I'm so grateful to them because they heightened my awareness and they're, they're the modern innovators. They're about 26 years old or more now. And 
The, the VP Foundation, led by Joanne Yant, brought forward this idea that the oxalates in food can create impact health conditions, especially pain, pelvic pain, vulvar pain, other forms of pelvic pain, and connective tissue problems. They brought this forward. There now there was old science already pre-existing that got dropped. But so they were they brought back something they didn't even know was already there. And they've been helping people with, with this kind of pain. So, but they didn't fully get the whole story. And so I didn't get the whole story either. I didn't understand how this toxicity works. And they don't even explain it as a toxicity. They treat it like, well, special people might have a connective tissue disorder and a pain disorder. And if you take these foods out of your diet, you get relief. But the story is bigger than that. And so I didn't figure it out until... Now I had several years of kind of being sort of modest in the high oxalate foods that I used to love. I used to be really big into whole wheat breads long in my vegan years, especially, and I had to get off them. And then I adopted sweet potatoes to substitute for bread and beans. Cause I had now clearly my system was not tolerating either wheat or beans, all legumes. And so now I needed something else to eat. So sweet potatoes became the thing because everyone says it's low allergy and they seem to be delicious and easy and available year round and they hold butter really well. <laughs> and, and when I did that change, I did not notice. Now, in retrospect, a lot of us who've now figured out that oxalates are a big piece of our health problems, big health gift if we can get them out of our diets because we can restore our health. But in retrospect, we do this kind of cadaver search and look back at our sad past and say, oh, there's a clue. One of the clues was when I switched to that sweet potato instead of bread and beans, I started getting crow's feet right away. And I wow. started getting pain in the back of my, in the rhomboid back here by the shoulder blades that would especially bother me at night. So bad, like it was like a little Charlie horse and it made it really hard to fall asleep. And anyone who was near, wow. I'd be like begging, could you like push on this? lump because I can't sleep. Um, and it turns out those are both clues. The, the aging of the skin, the muscle pains, which is sort of like a fibromyalgia knot or, you know, a trigger point knot where your muscles start starving for oxygen because the blood flow is being restricted and it's very painful. And it's also happening at bedtime, which in retrospect makes complete sense because it takes a while for the sweet potato I ate to get into the bloodstream and mess up the muscles. Wow, interesting. Right? So it's about four hours after I eat a food where the, the um, greatest amount of the oxalic acid that was in that sweet potato, the, the level of oxalic acid in my bloodstream is probably at its peak around four hours after I ate it. Well, for me, I was often having it for breakfast and a little at lunch many days. Or, or lunch or breakfast, and sometimes with dinner. And with dinner, I might sometimes have Swiss chard, which is a ridiculously high oxalate food, um, and you know various other things. So by bedtime, the level of oxalate in our blood is really probably at its highest all day long. Wow. So if yeah, we have symptoms so at bedtime, that's an oxalate clue that no one's ever pointed out ever anywhere. Wow. That, it, I think about like a blood sugar curve or something. And I think like if I drink a soda in the middle of the afternoon, I can pretty much tell in like 20 or 30 minutes that I'm crashing and I would need another soda or more sugary snacks. Is that what makes it so difficult to detect whether oxalates are becoming a problem is because there's so much of a delay. You don't think like the meal I had, well, that was several hours ago. You don't really blame that as part of like why you're getting pain in the shoulder or other physical symptoms that you're describing. Yeah, it's, 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 you never can seem to connect this. This is the biggest frustration about oxalates is you eat them and you can't tell that it's them bothering you. Be, not only this meal delay, but if you go on and off the low oxalate foods or you, know, you get off the high oxalate foods, like for example, the sweet potato. When I quit the sweet potatoes and everything else, I became lower in oxalate. And as we spoke in our last interview, when you stop eating oxalate, that gives the body a chance. It's a signal to the body to say, oh, well, all this oxalate that's been building up in your tissues now, now the body's like party time. We can finally get rid of this stuff. And so it starts unloading oxalate. So you can go, your oxalate level in your blood 
can also go up when you stop eating oxalates. So it goes up yeah. right after you eat them, but when you stop eating them, it also goes up because one of the sources of oxalate in the body is these old deposits that's, that can be mobilized. So if you're on and off oxalates, there's no correlation whatsoever with how much you're eating and how bad the oxalate level is in your urine, your blood, and where your symptoms are. So for me, this is why my information I got from the Volvo Foundation allowed me to like, well, the sweet potatoes don't seem to bother me. When I go back and I have my beloved sweet potatoes, which are organic in my garden, I don't feel any worse. I don't see any difference when I do or don't eat them. I could not correlate. I didn't know to look for a four hour peak later and think, oh, if it's after dinner, you know, could be related. But I also had no idea that if I've been on this low oxalate diet they're teaching me, and then I add back a sweet potato, that turns off the clearing. That tells the body, oh, can't do any more housekeeping. Now stop that, hold on to your stuff. And that actually helps the body lower oxalates in the body. So when you add back uh, just once or twice, you know, certain amounts, you, you feel better actually, because <laughs> the reason you feel better it's because this process of releasing or mobilizing oxalate from your, say your thyroid glands and your bones and bone marrow and tendons and back muscles or teeth or something gives you symptoms. It takes inflammation. The, the immune cells have to go in there and dig them out and blow acids and enzymes at these places that it's cleaning out the oxalates. It creates inflammation. In order for the immune cells to get there, you have to have permeable capillary beds that brings inflammation and fluids into tissues. You get heat, swelling, pain, and you get this toxic acid being re-released into the vascular system. You can get fatigue, neurotoxicity, more digestive problems. Um, you can feel kind of bad when you're re-poisoning yourself with old oxalate from inside. So it gets wow. really confusing. You go off and you feel good for a while, then you don't. You think, well, that must not be my problem because I'm still feeling bad. And then you add back in the high oxalate food and that sort of relieves it because it's turning off the clearing process. And you think, well, it, I used to tell myself the kind of oxalates and sweet potatoes don't bother me <laughs> because I didn't understand this process of clearing in the body, being able to turn on and off the clearing as at will. And that the diet itself is a signal to either hold on to or let go of oxalate. Wow. See, this is why I'm so grateful for you and your work, because as a nutrition coach who hasn't spent nearly as much time exploring this issue, that would have been just a completely vexing problem for me to deal with. And one of my clients said, yeah, like I, I cut them out and I felt terrible. And I put them back in and now I feel really good with sweet potatoes and, and Swiss chard. I'd be like, well, great. I guess you should eat those things. Like you don't, you don't realize you don't make those correlations, but that's the absolutely wrong thing to do. Yeah. Yep. So you wow. can see why this is an easy topic to ignore because it's, it's not as straightforward on the, on, in the interpretation of what's going on. You have to understand a deeper physiology, both how we get into trouble and how we unwind this, which is basically a bioaccumulative cumulative toxicity disorder where you have a deposition disease that needs probably a decade to, un, to reverse. That's crazy. Wow. I do want to go back in your story. I think this is really important to point out for people. You said, you know, you were vegan for a while, but you also had a period of time where you were vegetarian. And those two things kind of stacked up side by side, if I understand your story right. Can you take us back to that time? You know, tell us kind of what things you were eating, what your diet was like, why you switched over to veganism and why, especially like that series of events is a really not great idea. <laughs> Right. So I read um, Francis Moore LePay's book, Diet for a Small Planet, and that made me a noble vegetarian pretty quickly. And I was always a scratch cooker. I grew up cooking for the family and I was in college and I would use the Wednesday paper for the food specials and go buy whatever vegetables were on sale and cook cauliflower that week because it was on sale. I'm in college doing this, right? Very few college kids are eating their own homemade food. Uh, yeah, but I, that was I was the eating kind uncrustables, of, I think. Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm older than you are. We didn't have all this <laughs> stuff. Like soy milk was just coming out and it was available and very specialized, you know, like stinky health granola stops that were small and had fresh ground flour and soy, this and that everywhere. Soy flour was becoming a thing. And 
So you had to make an effort to find things like soy milk back then. And otherwise, you know, she was teaching us to buy soy flour. And obviously there was stores I could find them and, and how to cook with soy and adding it to wheat so that you would have a more complete set of amino acids and not completely wow. kill yourself on the incomplete proteins of vegetarianism. And then I, you know, I, I went off to Cornell and I took a summer class. I just did a post of this on Instagram, actually on my SK Norton account. And if anyone's looking for me there, there's also a new account called toxic superfoods oxalate book. Um, because I got hacked in March. So I had to create another account. So the, uh, the SK Norton one, I feel more free to just talk about me and my stuff. And the book one is more about the book and so on. But um, I took this course that just had us reread that same old book again, with absolutely no critical analysis of all of her arguments, whether they be social or political or nutritional. And I got credit, a summer class credit for some, like a really stupid course at an Ivy League institution. Wow. <laughs> and ah, oh, man, I was like, why did I waste tuition on rereading that book? I already know that I'm smart enough. I'm, I'm at Cornell. I didn't know how to read a book. I don't need you to tell me to read a book. <laughs> so, but in the meantime, I have, you know, I'm in, into like veggie journal and you know, clipping recipes and trying to get through school. And, and then, then John Robbins comes out with this book, Diet for a New America, that says all eggs are evil and all milk is mostly pus. So wow. <laughs> I changed from using yogurt as a standard kind of dairy. I would have like six to eight ounces of yogurt on a typical day. I dropped the dairy, which is sort of a tragic move to make because Dairy, the calcium and minerals in dairy, especially the calcium though, is protecting us slightly from oxalate because it, the oxalic acid is a calcium chelator and magnesium and iron and so on. But calcium helps to restrict the, the movement of oxalic acid from our gut into the blood a little bit. So it can reduce it by 10 to 30%. And that 10 to 30% is so valuable. <laughs> you want as little oxalic acid. So when you go and take out milk and dairy and cheese, you're taking out the main source of calcium in current modern diets. Because very few wow. people are chewing on fish bones all day. That's really the only other yeah. good Or cabbage. You can only eat so many heads of cabbage in a day and not be sick. <laughs> like there's not a lot. So that was a bad move. And at that same time is when I developed, and my diet was just whole foods cooked from, I'd use wheat berries. I would like soak my wheat berries and then cook them in the morning and then serve wheat berries for breakfast. And then send my friends off with like raw carrot sticks and, you know, little yogurts and you shouldn't go to the vending machine. You should take these nice cut celery and carrot sticks with you to work friend, you know, like I was, and then I was a uh, vegan and I moved in with some vegans and I was working as a, in the city of Cleveland, doing public health work, teaching about nutrition and doing the great American smoke out and working with kids to keep them on the straight and narrow and give them alternative things to do instead of being gangs and so on. And I was busy and I would set up a crock pot with mixed beans couple tablespoons of peanut butter, a couple cloves of garlic and let the beans cook overnight and then eat them for breakfast. Well, that is probably the most stupidest idea you could. Terrible, ever. terrible. That is a nightmare. Now I have a degree from Cornell and I didn't know better. Well, they don't teach you this stuff in school. I'm assuming, especially back then. Foods class is about a gluten ball. Um, I learned how to like, put water in flour and come up with this gluten ball. I learned how to make rolls. I learned that, you know, you put um, baking soda in vegetables and you destroy the B vitamins. If you cook, if you put baking soda in the water that you're boiling your vegetables in, um, you know, I learned how to look up stuff and kind of do diet, but we didn't learn really about safe preparation of food. We didn't learn any of this, how to deal with plant anti-nutrients. No one talked about plant anti-nutrients and their effects on absorption of nutrients. I mean, it was just mentioned here and there in textbooks and the textbook authors usually spend no more than three sentences on it. It's like a little, I'll mention here, mention here, but not as a topic, but in, and then in 
foods class two, you get a Whopper and you cut off a slice of Whopper, you dehydrate it in the autoclave, you grind it up, and then you learn how to do the various assays to analyze how much protein, carbs, and fat in it. So you get a little sense wow. of how labs work, but you don't learn practical stuff that really makes a difference. Wow. That's so interesting. I wonder if you almost need, you know, somebody like Dr. Bill Schindler who like travels the world and checks out all these like native cultures to be able to figure out like, yeah, this culture eats potatoes, but they have to cover it in clay to help detoxify it. Or yeah, maybe there's some beans eaten by this other culture, but these beans are soaked for like three or four days or wheat belly is fermented or something. Like you, you almost need those like natural practices to be able to understand how we should really be treating food. None of those historical um, wisdom, the wisdom that comes out of the human traditions of how we adopted foods and, and made them sort of safe to eat, these vegetable foods especially, those all, you know what we learned? We learned that pica was an eating disorder. Wow. Pica is like eating dirt and things like that. And women, when they're pregnant, they often need extra minerals and so on. And, they, and a nutritional urge might make them ha eat dirt. But we know now that eating clay is a detoxer and it's a binder and it helps you do better. And the clay is actually has benefits and it also has minerals in it. It could be that they're mineral starved and they're eating, but they just call it pica. Is a, They used to tell us that women in the third world get this eating disorder called pica and it's really bad. Like it's something we should tell wow. them to not do. And like, we didn't learn anything that was the least bit respectful of cultures. We didn't learn anything about food production or agriculture, even though our school is right on the ag quad. Even the ag students aren't learning about, you know, sustainable production and what we can do to feed the masses. That's like more than just weird technology. My friends who were studying botany were learning about the flavor saver tomato and how cool this is, this like coming along and faster ways to change plants and their genetic expressions through these, you know, we weren't learning the stuff that now in retrospect, 40 years later, um, makes more sense. Yeah, that's so interesting. And it's something that comes up all the time when somebody says, I'm, you know, I, I'm going to start following a paleo diet, I'm going to eat what our ancestors ate. So I'm going to eat a lot of meat and vegetables. And I cringe a little bit when I hear that because I'm like, ah, I don't think they ate a ton of vegetables. I think most of the things you walk into the produce aisle and see as vegetables probably were not around even a few hundred years ago, let alone through our evolution. No question about that. It's so funny that people think, you know, like paleo man was out picking broccoli all day. <laughs> paleo woman was like not into broccoli because it didn't exist. And most, you know, really it's been the last 400 years where we've really been developing more and more varieties of things. I know in Peru, it took them a long time to develop hundreds and hundreds of varieties of potatoes. But even getting Westerners to bother with potatoes and they didn't bring the clay technology with them and say we should soak them in clay and make them safer to eat. Um, it People were not initially very receptive to the potato because by itself, it's pretty bland and boring. And so they, they thought of it as livestock feed, right? So depending on what kind of land you had, a potato might be appropriate use of your land and you could feed it to your pigs and then have pork and milk and stuff that you wanted. Um, so it took, it took a while for us to adopt these things. And often there's some kind of, um, real cultural pressure for it uh, to have to do this. But then in the meantime, we keep inventing like the original tomatoes, my understanding were, you know, the size of a giant raspberry and they were hard and dark and bitter and not very interesting food. But now we have heirloom tomatoes, hundreds of quote heirloom tomatoes, but they're all human inventions. Corn is a human invention. And you couldn't have a giant ear right. of corn that doesn't spread its seeds on itself in nature. I mean, birds help a lot with seed spreading, grant you that, but it's, it takes a lot of work for the squirrels and birds to spread corn seeds around. We, so much of the food we think is, oh, we must have, this is normal food. We've, cause in our short lives, in our short history of knowing grandma's dinner and mom's dinner and ours, we have no perspective of the million of years of history of human eating. And paleo yeah, totally. is a great concept, right? But then everybody comes up with cookbooks that says paleo man needed um, almond muffins and almond pancakes <laughs> with chocolate sauce. Ridiculous. And urethritol. You re that's just absolutely, I don't remember that in the cave paintings, um, <laughs> you know, almond flour, like did they, they paint with that? It's, yeah, it's, it's such a bizarre 
story, how, how we got to this place of thinking all these things are healthy for us when for a lot of people, they cause a lot of harm. And, and again, it's all the superfoods is everything that you talk about in your upcoming book. And so I'm, I'm wondering if we can maybe now talk about what exactly are oxalates for people that are wondering. And I, I would really love to explore like, why, why do plants make them? What purpose do they serve? Because they do a lot of good for the plant. And the plant, like we talked about last time, plants are not around just for us to like enjoy and eat and chop, you know, and, and get rid of all the time. Like they're, they're there for their own reason. Yeah. And they're very useful to us just being there because they create the air we're breathing. Like very important. without them, we're, we're in trouble. Right. And that's, you know, part of the solution right now is like plant more trees and do this stuff because they're such an important part of the ecosystem and we've misinterpreted them as just wanting to feed us in modern lore. I mean, you really, if you were to eat this plant right here, this is not going to be a good meal. And That's everyone right. knows if your child were eating this plant, which is really lovely, ag aglaonema, your kid is going to get sick and it might That's be right. so sick that you might end up in the emergency room. Remember yep. you berries on the bushes. This is not, plants are, very few of them out in nature are edible. The ones that are edible, we have had to create and nurture and play with and then do things like soak them in clay and so on and use particular parts in particular ways. And we've lost sight of that. And you can see that in this recent disaster with this vegan lentil thing that has been making people sick. That is exactly what we're talking about where this product has not prepared lentils in a traditional way. And the, the way they're asking people to cook it at home is completely a new way to handle lentils. And then the way that's being delivered, prepared and consumed is makes it quite toxic and people are getting in trouble eating that. Um, so is this plant, a specific reason, thing? I wasn't, I wasn't aware of this. Is oh. it, is, was the lentil thing is a specific problem right now? Yes, there's a product, oh. there's a vegan product. I've forgotten the name of it, but it's been in the news the last couple of weeks of people getting quite sick on this vegan lentil crumbles and wow. lentils are very high in a different compound. They're not very high in oxalate. And I will get back to your question. Like why do plants need oxalate and oxalic acid? We'll get to that. But to just to finish up the lentil piece, lentils are very high in lectins. Mm -hmm. Lectin is a, a family of gigantic proteins that bind to carbohydrates and there's little carbohydrate molecules on cells. So they bind to cells and they kind of ruin cells and cause a lot of problems. And they're basically, gluten is an example of a leptin molecule that again, can get you into trouble and start destroying your digestive system and can even get into tissues like your brain and start getting connecting to cells. And so lectins are bad, bad news. That's why my slow cooking of the beans was so bad for me because by slow cooking those beans, those lectin proteins were not getting denatured. You need very high heat. You need to stimulate those beans like lentils into a sort of germination state where their physiology is shifting and then nail them with really high heat. And in India, they know they always use a pressure cooker when they cook their lentils and beans. But whatever they're doing in this company producing this lentil product, they're not using water-based pressure cooked and they're not soaking them and germinating them and dealing with the lectin problem and whatever other compounds are in there. And then a person is to fry this prepared in oil at home. None of that is oh my God. traditional preparation. So it's, it's messing up people giving them intestinal. Wow. And, wow. Yeah. Well, thank you for that explanation. I was not aware of that. That's insane. Yeah. And I, I feel bad for anybody because I, my use of slow cooked beans gave me a very bad case of irritable bowel syndrome where I would be doubled over in pain, wondering if I should die. I, I remember being on the bathroom floor. And then one time I was trying to drive back home from the gym and I had to pull to a side street and wait for 10 minutes for the cramps to stop so I could safely drive. Wow. Yeah. Serious? And I wow. didn't realize any of this until fairly recently. I was, you know, still in my twenties when that was happening. And that's thanks to my <sighs> vegan diet. Wow. And, you know, I'm almost 60 now at age, age 58. <laughs> so that was a while ago. <laughs> oh, well, you look great. <laughs> yeah. Well, luckily, you know, if you're on the straight and narrow, like I've been eating real foods instead of eating junk vegetarian foods 
and not really, I haven't been consuming seed oils and soybean oil. And I've been so strict about that for so long. Um, I'm recovering from my oxalate problems and still look kind of put together. <laughs> <laughs> you look very well put together. Thank you. It is amazing you can reverse that. <laughs> so I think, I think that's another example of your, your nutritional history. If you've been on a lot of highly processed commercial foods that are devoid of nutrients and have toxic rancid oils in them that makes the toxins, the natural toxins in plants, even more toxic. And even the recovery from that is probably also harder because the amount of metabolic damage and cellular, you know, your cell membranes have to be made of materials that you put in your body. And if you put the wrong fats in your cell membranes, your, your basic, all your physiology is affected by cell membrane capacities that are determined by what they're made of. And you got a lot of trans fats and bent fats and weird fatty acids in your cells and you're not happy. It's same with yeah. oxalates running around, really messing up membranes and really causing cell death and inflammation. So I probably should go back to your question. <laughs> <laughs> Why do plants need oxalate? Right? Why do plants need oxalate? Why do they need it? Well, they don't totally know. And the researchers have identified like six or seven purposes for oxalate, oxalic acid. And then the, the plants make oxalic acid. In many cases, the physiology of plants seems to be make vitamin C first and then turn that into oxalic acid, which is interesting because vitamin C easily transforms itself into oxalic acid. It probably can do it in the pill itself, in the jar, in the food, but it definitely does it in our bodies. And a major source of oxalic acid which becomes oxalate, which is the salt form that starts creating crystals in the body. The major form of oxalic acid uh, that comes, that's called internal production is really coming from vitamin C. So you can overconsume vitamin C definitely with supplements. And even, there's even a couple of studies that suggest overdoing C even in natural fruits and vegetables is pro-oxidative. And so wow. if you do it all the time, it creates oxidative stress. Um, so, and that's probably because the vitamin C turns to oxalic acid in the body. That's where the wow. oxidative problem comes from is when you have high, high levels of vitamin C is vitamin C is directly pro-oxidative and anti-cancer because it's just cell murdering and this, the cancer cells are more susceptible. So anyway, the plants need that oxalic acid because it helps them manage calcium. If you, some plants are really sensitive to too much calcium, like all of us, we need just the right amount of calcium in our cells and soils are loaded with calcium. So when there's high calcium soil, the plants need more oxalic acid to manage that. In fact, with tomatoes, if it's high calcium soil and it's a very humid summer, the tomatoes will make so many oxalic acid crystals, this is calcium oxalate crystals that they get these little yellow bumps on their, what they call the shoulders, the top curve of the tomato will have yellowing and little bumps, little like blisters. And those are the oxalic acid crystals kind of breaking up the felt, this other cells in the tissue. So those tomatoes wow. don't keep well, they, they're not marketable. So it's a big problem if you have too much calcium and you have a humid summer because the oxalate gets so much that it wrecks the tomato itself. So the tomatoes trying to contain the damage that just free roaming calcium would do to them in that human environment. And by doing so, that still has side effects. So even crystals forming in the tomato is hurting the tomato, but it doesn't matter if you're a tomato because your only purpose is to spread seeds for next year. So if the flesh That's is right. damaged, nature is not too worried about it. So you're going to manage your calcium and trees will shed the calcium through the tree bark. Apparently, most of the soot that forms from burning wood is calcium oxalate um, coming off the bark. Um, and the, the plants use these crystals also, plants deliberately construct crystals in a very, uh, many sets of specific shapes. And they do this by laying out a whole matrix or scaffolding with amino acids. And many amino acids are attractive to calcium. So calcium and oxalate will set up on these amino acids just so, and the plants know this and can build very deliberate shapes. One of the shapes they like to build is this double pointed arrow. It's like a toothpick, uber tiny, many hundreds of toothpicks and little bundles, like little you know, quivers, like 200 little arrows. And they're deliberately designed for defense. They can penetrate our mucous membrane cells, two cells deep these little arrows. 
Wow. And they, the, That's crazy. I've seen videos where the, the plant is deliberately shooting them out one at a time. So I tell people that plants build calcium oxalate crystals is part of the original invention of warfare. Like the spear was invented by plants. It's wow. just so small. They never got credit for their cleverness. <laughs> well, they're getting credit now. They are. We, we love plants. I'm a great gardener. I'm a lover of trees. I have been my whole life. I love flowers. Um, I even just put a flower picture on my Instagram today because it's summer and my flowers are happy. Um, and these plants, you know, they're, they're doing it. The ones that were in the shade, like this is a shade plant. The ones that are house plants come from the tropics and it's a shade plant. This shade plant ha gets long in this low light in the house probably because it makes calcium oxalate, what I call disco balls. So these multi-sided sort of really crazy, lots of little plates of oxalate in here allows the light that comes into the leaf to bounce around inside that cell. And every little bit of that photon of light gets used for energy. We're not wasting the light because we're, we're letting the light bounce all over the place and the the plant can use that energy. The other thing that they're saying, yeah, it's fascinating. It's so cool. And plants are fantastic. And they, one of the things they'll do is they'll apparently, I mean, I think this is still like, they're still arguing a little bit about it, but the cactus and the, the desert plants make a ton of oxalate. And it seems that it's using calcium oxalate. Now oxalate is a two carbon molecule. It's an organic molecule that has carbon in it. And plants breathe carbon right? They breathe CO2. That's why they're good for this like carbon sequestration thing, right? They breathe CO2 and they produce oxygen, but they do this breathing and producing of oxygen during the sun times. When the sun is out, that's when they're creating glucose and sugars and building and growing. Well, in the sun in the desert, it's parched, man. There's this really dry. And the plants have this breathing hole on the bottom of the leaves called stoma. The stoma have to close in the hot heat or else the plant would turn to crisp, right? So the stoma is closed. It can't breathe in the daytime. It can't get, it can't get the CO2 from the air because it can't breathe. So what it uses is the oxalic acid, the two carbon oxalate as a carbon source overnight. So during the day, it uses up oxalate and during the night, it makes more oxalate. So the, the plants make oxalic acid crystals in order to be able to do photosynthesis in the desert in dry periods when there's no rain and the air is crispy dry. That's incredible. Wow. It's, there's like a whole bunch of uses. Another one is the leaves on plants will turn oxalate, oxalic acid, release it as acid, and then turn that into um, hydrogen peroxide which will kill funguses. So these arrows help kill insects and deter insects. The, um, then you can kill funguses, you can, you can, and then you can kind of irritate the throat of people who dare to eat too many kiwis or too many something or other. So you're deferring, you're, you're discouraging predation, you're killing off fungus. You're just living your life and protecting yourself because there you are plopped in the ground. You, you don't have claws, except, you know, you make thorns and you do all these, you do everything you can to say, look, don't eat me. But then you right. have this chemical system underneath that's supporting good physiology and self-defense. Wow. So I always just pictured the crystals as being the damaging part of oxalate, but it's, it's more than that, right? When these things get into our body, can you describe some of the ways, you know, besides like the physical um, that they're, they're harming us? Yeah. And I've got an Instagram post that shows like the form. So there's oxalic acid, it shows the chemistry, and then it shows you that it goes into nano crystals and micro crystals and the plant shapes. So when you're eating the plant shapes, you're basically eating ground glass, really tiny microscopic ground glass. You don't notice it, but it's there. And that just sort of roughs up your intestinal tract and can be, you know, damaging physically as a mechanical toxin, but it's the acid, the free acid. And more of it is freed up by our stomach, which is a very acidic environment. The acid of our stomach can dissolve a little bit of these crystals. So there's some of what we call insoluble probably becomes a little more soluble thanks to the stomach. And that acid floats in the water. It's such a tiny molecule right into the blood between the cells. So it doesn't have to get into cells. It just gets into the blood and starts floating around in the blood. Now you've got the crystals and the exposure to the ions in the gut cells, but now it's in the blood cells. The blood cells within 40 minutes 
the immune cells that are circulating in your bloodstream are showing oxidative stress and damaged mitochondria. And now they're starting to put out pro-inflammatory cytokines into the system. And they've moved from like a nice little immune cell to somebody who's like having a problem. It's been injured. It's telling the whole body, hey, something's here bothering me. This pro-oxidative event is occurring. So now you're, you're damaging. And I think the degree to which that happens, there's a lot of variability from person to person. And they had, there's only been one study that's bothered to even look at that. It's a pretty recent study, and I don't know if anybody will bother to fund additional studies on that. But clearly we know that oxalic acid is not healthy for membranes, it depolarizes them, and the mitochondria is a membrane. And you don't even have to physically touch the cell as long as it's in within sort of electromagnetic earshot, you might say, you can start affecting these mitochondria. And the blood that comes from your stomach and comes from your small intestines and your colon, all of that that's draining the food and nutrients and oxalic acid out of your food, it goes straight to your liver, right? Your liver has to clean up whatever you're absorbing for your food to protect the rest of the body. The liver has no way to get rid of the oxalate. It doesn't detox oxalate. It actually makes more oxalate. So after the blood goes to the liver, it, it's got more oxalate than it had, than it got out of your spinach smoothie and your sweet potato. But in the meantime, your poor liver is dealing with oxalic acid after every meal for four to eight hours after every meal. And this uses up a lot of glutathione and some of the natural antioxidant power that protects your liver. The liver does a pretty good job of protecting itself, but chronic high oxalate meals day in and day out, like I did forever, can land you into chemical sensitivity, uh, alcohol intolerance, um, you know, fragrances bother you. And some of that's probably the wear and tear on the liver. And so it's messing up the liver, it's messing up your immune cells and it hasn't even gotten very far. <laughs> it hasn't gone anywhere yet. It's next stop, it, you know, the liver has this vein that drains the vein and it takes it straight to the heart. So it passes through the diaphragm. And interesting enough about the diaphragm, the diaphragm is an innervated muscle that has to help you breathe in and out. And sometimes if the nerves aren't happy or the muscles aren't happy, you get in these spasms called hiccups. Well, a hiccup is a neurotoxicity symptom and you can make the vagal nerve and the nerves of the body toxic with oxalate. So this is what used to happen to me at bedtime after my lovely healthy dinner of sweet potatoes and whatever, I would have attacks of hiccups and then belching. Belching is another reaction to oxalate, some kind of bloating and belching and detest intestinal distress. These were all happening like clockwork at bedtime, almost every night for years. I often felt I was gonna break a rib. It was so awful. Yeah, hiccups are like kind of funny for a minute and then not so funny after a while. And I, it, it just occurred to me, I, I, I used to get hiccups all the time, but since I've been more strict carnivore, I can't remember the last time I've gotten it. It's so funny. Because that was a neuro reaction, a neurotoxic reaction to oxalate probably. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. I know we talked about I didn't about even know time. that. I didn't even know hiccups was a neurotoxicity sign until I started reading all these oxalate cases where people get really sick or die on star fruit, which is very high in oxalate. And um, one of the, the last symptoms before either the human or the rat in the rat study dies is hiccups. Like right at the end, you start getting hiccups. <laughs> oh my that's God. crazy. <laughs> crazy yeah i had no idea any of that it's so so interesting as we're going yeah through, we like, haven't even got far in the body like we've already wrecked the digestive system the the immune cells the liver function the diaphragm and its nerves and the vagal nerve aren't too happy about all this and then the next organ that gets gets all the oxalate that you absorbed plus the stuff the liver just made goes to your heart the heart really needs its calcium, by the way, the blood has to have a certain calcium level in order to have the pacemaker work well. And if a lot of oxalate is coming in or coming out of your tissues, this happens more frequently with the, after you quit eating oxalate actually, where oxalate is not coming from your digestion anymore, it's coming from your bones or your thyroid gland. You get a loss of calcium in the blood enough to start disturbing the heart rate and you get some arrhythmias, heart palpitations, elevated blood pressure. Some people feel like they're gonna have a heart attack or stroke and they end up in the emergency room with an electrolyte crash. That's what's happening. They're having an electrolyte crash. So this is another big thing. You get 
major disturbance in electrolytes and electrolyte management in the body. And this is happening both on the way in and as oxalates leave. So managing and uh, you know replacing, replenishing all the electrolytes, not just the calcium, which is super important, um, is, is an issue. But that's the same reason why the, the spasms are happening in the nerves and in the muscle, because in order for nerves or muscles to work, there's this little calcium ion in the cells that's being carefully managed in order for the cell to do its job of saying, do this, do this, don't do that. An oxalate can grab or chelate that calcium and completely disturb the cell function, which makes total sense that you can't have, you can't keep flooding your cells with something that messes up calcium and have cells this is the main way that oxalates toxicity is working. It's through disturbance of calcium regulation in cells and disturbance of electrolytes around the cells in the interstitial fluids and in the blood. Wow, this is maybe a good time to ask you. I, I wanted to ask you last time, I kind of forgot. When I was growing up and eating peanut butter sandwiches, which would, you know, peanuts are very high in oxalate, I believe. I never liked to drink milk, but when I had peanut butter sandwiches, I loved drinking that with skim milk. Could that possibly be why? Uh, you know, it's a very good theory. I think kids are instinctual a lot about eating. And <laughs> that's a very good theory that you needed calcium and that experience of eating. And of course, but peanut butter has this thing of sticks on your roof of your mouth and does weird things. And it's like, you got to wash it down with something. Um, I never liked peanut butter as a kid. I thought peanut butter and jelly sandwiches were a stupid idea. The only food I didn't like as a kid was mustard and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Funny. <laughs> That's funny. I'd much rather have yogurt and believe it or not, like pickled herring as a kid. I liked real food. <laughs> very, very different childhood than the way I grew up. I can tell you that. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, nobody liked me because I actually liked what adults told us we were supposed to eat. Except <laughs> That's that crazy. darn peanut butter sandwich. It's just yucky. It's so funny. <laughs> That's great. Well, of course, when I was older, I learned to love peanut butter and eat it in scoops out of the big, you would buy these like plastic tubs of two pounds of peanut butter for families back then. And you'd sit around the table at bedtime when your parents have already gone to bed and you'd like eat scoops of peanut butter, have crackers, then like hand eat cereal. And then you get out the ice cream and you do this little pig out party as a teenager with your siblings and like peanut That's butter hilarious. was part of it. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious wow well if you like pickled herring you clearly my mother wasn't spice. feeding us enough <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing your new book called toxic superfoods tell us a little bit about the message you're trying to convey i love the title by the way the title's amazing and we just i don't know we just seem to give a free pass to all of these foods that tend to be really really high in oxalates and we just say like these are healthy you need to have more um i mean it came it came to like uh, liam hemsworth i believe was the name of the actor um in in 2020 that that had i think it was kidney stones and he was having these shakes in the morning with like five cups of spinach in every shake and, and we just think spinach is great beets are great uh rhubarb great all of these foods are really healthy for us what was the message you wanted to bring forth when when you wrote your book and especially with the name toxic superfoods well i you know my initial motivation for all of this was like wow if i could mess up my health and i have a degree in nutrition and public health and been in integrated medicine and have all these connections with holistic healers and mainstream medicine and medical schools and I did not know why I had all these health problems, all this arthritis, fatigue, back pain. It goes on and on. How is anyone else going to know about this? I feel like anyone else who cares about their health and is a food geek deserves a chance to learn about this. And I'm willing to just throw this out as a little, hey, hey by the way, <laughs> maybe you should think about this one. Um, and so I share my story and the short story of my clients in that book and just say, look, if you don't feel awesome and you know, people who aren't doing well and they're eating quinoa and spinach and beet greens and nuts and doing the keto stuff. And these diets that are the paleo diet interpretation, most people go there and they're so, okay, you can't have wheat. So you have all these wheat substitutes. You can use buckwheat because that's not really a grain and you can have potatoes like crazy buckwheat quinoa. This stuff is really high in oxalate. Oh, and have all the almond meal you want because of course everybody was cracking almonds in, in paleo days. So people adopt diets to help themselves and they are going from the frying pan into the fire because they're adopting a much more high oxalate diet. And everyone says, well, when you go on this diet to get rid of your allergies or to do this or this, 
you're going to have Herx reactions. You're going to feel a little worse. Maybe it's okay if it doesn't work for you because it'll work later. Um, and it's very hard for people to put it together because you never would question these precious foods. They're so sacred in our, you know, current culture. We are guilty of only wanting to hear what we want to hear and insisting on just emphasizing benefits and never questioning all of our assumptions. I have tried to reach out to fellow colleagues that I work with in the field of integrative medicine. I've tried to reach out to people at universities where I got my degree. Uh, I've tried to reach out to others to see if I could get colleagues, because I'm an academic. I'm used to working with fellow academics and thinking academically about ideas and facts and exploring them, but nobody's interested. So as you said, the grassroots are ready for something more because it isn't working. So this book is a little SOS that covers soup to nuts, like stories galore, why plants are using them, the history of oxalate, the history of oxalate illness, why medicine isn't paying attention to it, why nutrition is deaf to it, uh, how other aspects of our diet make oxalate worse, this whole accumulation thing, no one has pulled together all the science that shows that all of us have oxalate crystals in our body. Not, it's not just the kidney stone, which is the classic kidney stone is made of calcium oxalate. All of us have some kind of oxalate in our thyroid glands and our bones and bone marrow because our culture has been raising us on too many plant foods. And what, what I've had to learn by letting the facts lead me rather than my belief system, I've had to set my belief system down and look for facts based on real world observation and see how the science confirms the real world observation rather than the real world fantasy. And you know, when I was being such a healthy, homemade, home cooked, homegrown, organic vegetarian, buying local foods and piling up on plant foods, I should have been feeling good. I was feeling like garbage. That's a fact. The fact of my clean, pure diet is true. No one can tell me otherwise. And no one can tell me that I wasn't sick as a dog and that I didn't lose a lifetime of productivity and joy from that. And so we wow. go from there. We go from the reality of my life and the lives of thousands of others and the reality of what the science really says. And what the science really says is you can't trust a plant as long as you can chew on one. They're loaded <laughs> with chemicals. <laughs> You can't wow. trust them. And having a fantasy that they're the great heroes is layers of cultural wishing that's been going on for 400 years that we thought, well, we could liberate mankind from kings and oppressors and get away from all this bad cultural stuff if we're just kinder to each other and do democracy and fairness. And while we're being democratic, why don't we free the animals and not take care of the animals and use them for food? And uh, you know, we, we took that moralism to the level of now, you know, you should make all animals your best friend and instead of take care of them because our, it's a mutual agreement. They're there, they feed us, we take care of them, we take care yeah. of their proper genetics and health and we, we, we need diversity and animals that we grow for food. So as long as we're growing animals for food, we're promoting diversity. It's just like grass is using us because we love grass and grass is doing yeah. pretty well now. Animals would do well if we're, we care about eating them because we need to take care of them to take care of ourselves. But that all got lost in this moralism that led to basically the American Revolution. And there's been this long history of preachers of various stripes promoting things like Bran, like the guy that invented, whose name was now Graham, became Graham Flower, became the Graham Cracker. He was one of these sort of nut jobs who tried to live on nothing but brand. And uh, there's a lot of that. It's really interesting, the history of that in the US and elsewhere of these. Um, a lot of them were religious zealots who felt like oh, yeah. needed to oh, yeah. just not eat meat because that would make you have carnal desire and you would be That's inappropriate. Right. And, uh, That's right. John Harvey Kellogg went to Seventh Day Adventist. I mean, he was pro pro adult super. Or I'm sorry, circumcision, not just male, also to deter people from masturbating. pleasure. That's right. That's right. And because you go to hell, like diet. why did he need them to not go to hell? Maybe there's more room in heaven if you let everyone else go to hell. But somehow, <laughs> it's real important to cut off other people's sexual expression to save their soul. So the, and then of course the people he influenced 
and the people he worked with, uh, he's part of the story of why we eat peanut butter. Yeah. And he's part of the story of the birth of home economics, which is the field of nutrition and the whole birth of the dietetics, really the whole birth of dietitians comes from a nurse that studied under him at his nursing school, who was a fellow seventh day Adventist. And, um, that's right. That same textbook, I mentioned this in my book too, the same textbook that they wrote in 1917 was the same textbook I used in the 1980s at Cornell. <laughs> this was like wow. the 17th edition or I don't know, wow. exact same title, exact same book. So the heritage hasn't been dropped. Yeah. And, and, and if, if you're listening to this for the first time, you think this sounds totally bonkers like this is all true and the seventh day adventists are not shy about it they brag about it they they tell like yeah we've influenced nutrition in all of these different media outlets that they own and all the different schools that they own like it's not a secret and you can look at this and and the seventh day adventists will tell you it's crazy well in a way they invented the processed food industry and they own a huge amount of the processed food industry and they're still behind processed foods because devoid deficient foods does suck the life out of you. And you know, if you don't have vitality, you don't have a sex life. Let me tell you, if you're laying in bed burping and belching, you don't have a sex life. <laughs> that is a very good point. Yeah, that's a very good point. Before I turn you loose, I do want to ask you, there's something you do on your Instagram that I actually love. And it's always like a little play on words, but it's a note from the Oxalate Poison universe where you talk about somebody's success stories, which I really love. Can you tell us why it's so important to share the people that you work with and their stories and all the wonderful things that they are able to walk away from and, and kind of, you know, walk back here over time. Yeah. You know, many of us are so flabbergasted that we followed all this advice for so long and we got so sick and sicker and sicker. And now like pretty quickly, right now there's been a lot of conversation about anxiety, how horrible it is to have anxiety and depression. And people went to therapists for 30 years and they just thought it was their dad's abuse or something. And now Within two weeks of getting off oxalate, they feel peaceful. They feel calm. They can focus. People talk about their autism going away and they're kind enough to share that and say, you know what? I used to need therapy and now I don't. And so sometimes they'll say that in just a way and I'll share it on my stories. And they, they are creating this grassroots conversation because if only somebody would listen to them, they, they feel a lot of frustration that they can't tell their husband or their children who are vegetarians or their best friends or their sisters. Um, And they're frustrated with their own families because I think some of us who get particularly sick have both environmental and genetics that are shared in families where we're exposed to the same peanut butter and the same bad foods. And we also have the same tendencies, so say to allergies or susceptibility to gut damage from these plant foods. And so the whole family might have different versions of oxalate poisoning. And, and my followers, several of them would be like, well, I can't convince my sister that her urinary tract infections and her arthritis and her this or that is exactly the same oxalate problem that I'm having over here with my this and my that. So yeah, we're sharing stories. Anybody who has stories to share, please do. I'll be doing a series of testimonial interviews and putting them on my YouTube channel this summer with clients and followers so they can share, you know, their plantar fasciitis, their crystals in their bladder, their nighttime urination that made them so depressed because they could never sleep because they were eating all these high oxalate foods. And for years, they were on sleep medications that never worked. And they've been walking zombies. And one person he said he wanted to commit suicide. And, and some of my followers said that their sister just recently, she told me her sister did commit suicide from the anxiety wow. that was probably from oxalate poisoning. So this is very wow. serious. And so the message is, if you got some serious stuff wrong with you, if you have inflammation, autoimmune diseases, aches and pains and anxiety and mind problems. You should not be poisoning your brain and your tissues any further than you already have. And, and backing off of that in a informed way can it's amazing it's amazing so people are willing to share their miracles and i just like i never get tired of hearing stories and choking up that's so awesome 
That's so awesome. The work that you are doing, it's just, it's so wonderful. You present your message in a way that's really easy to understand. It's very kind and accepting. And I just, your work is amazing. You're such an amazing human being. I cannot wait for the book, which is available on pre-order, I believe. Um, and if you could tell the audience where they can go to find you, to connect with you and your work and where they can go to get the book. Yeah, the book is available anywhere books are sold and you can order it as a physical book, which I encourage people to do who can get that and an audio book and also an ebook. Uh, so just look at your favorite outlets to find it. And if you can't find it, we'll give you a link. You can send, you can write to us at my website, which is sallyknorton.com and we can send you the Random House link. It's coming from Random House through the Harmony, you no, know, through uh, Rodale Press. Um, and sometimes you can easily find it from them. So my website is a good place to connect with us. I offer small group classes. You can sign up and come meet some other people that way. You can connect with me on my two different Instagram accounts, which are SK Norton and toxic superfoods underscore oxalate underscore book. And I'm not really on Facebook very much, so that's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Well, that's already many places where people can go where they can find you. Sally Norton, it is such an honor to host you again. Thank you so very much for all of your work. Like I said, I did want to tell you that one of the interviews I listened to before um, this interview, uh, just earlier this morning, right before you came on, they aired an ad for almond milk, which I thought was like terribly ironic and really funny. I thought you'd get a kick out of that. <laughs> but it's a I'm sure process. that's I'm happening a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. Uh, but Sally Norton, again, thank you so very much for taking the time out of your busy life to come on our show today and educate our listeners. We're so grateful for you and thank you so very much. I'm so grateful for your interest in this topic. Thank you. It's all, It's been really fun to be with you. So I look forward to future times as well. Absolutely. You have a lifetime invite to come on anytime. <laughs> thank you. And this has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio.